Hello and welcome to lecture 24 of probabilistic machine learning. The last two lectures have been focused on a very interesting insight, which is that the relationship, and here's a new way of phrasing it that I haven't used before, the relationship between a probability distribution P over any variable X and any other probability distribution Q over any other variable Z can be described in terms of this equation that is here at the top of this slide, which states that the log marginal over x can be written as the sum of two terms. One term, which we have come to, to call either the expected complete data log likelihood, the negative variational free energy, or the elbow, the evidence lower bound, all words for the same thing, and the KL divergence between Q and the conditional distribution for the variable Z under, the, uh, under P. So this is an abstract relationship between these distributions P of X and Q of Z, which we have, or maybe arguably between Q of Z and P of X and Z, if you like, so a generative model for X and Z. And we've used this in two different ways so far. Two lectures ago, we first encountered it, and also in applications in the Gaussian mixture model, we encountered it as a, as a lever to help us um, find maximum likelihood estimates for any parameters that um, P of X might have. And the idea there is to say, if we have access to this full conditional distribution P of Z given X and theta, then <clears throat> we can just set Q to this value, to this P of, or to this function, to this P of Z given X. When we do that, the KL divergence is minimized and actually becomes zero. It vanishes because, well, yeah, it's two arguments are the same. And that means that the log marginal likelihood P of X given theta is equal to the elbow. And then we can maximize the elbow as a function of theta instead of the log marginal likelihood. This is easier occasionally or frequently, because, well, simply speaking, because the elbow has the sum outside of the logarithm. So instead of having to compute the logarithm of an expected value, we have to compute the expected value of the log complete theta log likelihood, and then we can maximize that with respect to theta. This algorithm is called the EM algorithm for expectation maximization, because we are maximizing a function that is actually the expected expected complete data log likelihood rather than the marginal likelihood. Now EM is a framework for parameter inference, inference on theta, if we have access to the exact conditional distribution P of Z given X. In the last lecture, we realized that we can actually use the same mathematical relationship between Q of Z and P of X and Z to also construct probabilistic approximations, not point estimates, not, not to maximize likelihoods, but to construct approximate distributions in the case where this conditional distribution P of Z given X, which we can also think of as a posterior for some latent variable Z given some data X, we can use this relationship to construct approximations to this posterior. In such situations where X can be thought of as data, or has the role of data, and Z are the latent variables that we care about, we, we um, in fact, we also motivated this by saying we can take theta and move it into Z. In such situations, um, the, we can think of, a, so we might typically not have access to P of Z given X, it's intractable, so instead we consider an arbitrary approximation Q of Z as a function that we, sh uh, a probability distribution that we want to be as close as possible to P of Z given X. And we can quantify this as close as possible in the sense that, that in this relationship, the right hand side, the K, uh, in the right hand side, the KL divergence between Q and P will now in general be non-zero and it will provide a measure of similarity, one possible measure of similarity between Q and the posterior P of Z given X. Now, because the left-hand side is now a constant, because X is just the data, so it's given to us and it's just a number, 
we can um, consider the elbow, the evidence lower bound, as a quantity that we can try to maximize to simultaneously minimize the KL divergence. So when we do that, then the, um, the we, we are, well, we are, we are equivalently minimizing the KL divergence, and that's maybe a good thing in itself, in the sense that it minimizes some divergence, right? Of course, there's many different measures of similarity between probability distributions, and this particular KL divergence, also in this particular direction, is maybe not a unique smart thing to do, but it is a very interesting approach to construct probability distributions that approximate the true positive. Now, one way to do this would be to decide that Q of Z should be some parametric some parameterized probability distribution, for example, a Gaussian distribution. And then we can write down, we can hope that potentially we might be able to write down the elbow in terms of, uh, as a closed form expression, so maybe if we're lucky we get to compute the elbow in closed form, we won't always be able to do that, but maybe we're lucky and we get to do that, and then we can just maximize it as a function of the parameters of the, the Gaussian. But actually we realized last uh, lecture, or well, through a tedious process that maybe went by a, a bit quickly, so we have to revisit it today again, that we don't always have to immediately do this drastic step. We don't always have to immediately assume that Q has a parametric form. Instead, we can actually get away with making weaker constraints on what Q is. If we ask for the optimal choice of Q without any constraints, then we know what that optimal choice is. It's just P of Z given X. And we know by assumption that we can't compute that. If we could compute it, we would just do it, and then we wouldn't have to do this whole spiel here. But let's assume that we can't compute P of Z given X, then we might still be able to say, I would like to find the optimal probability distribution Q of Z, not in a parameterized form, just the optimal function under the sole restriction that I wanted to factorize over certain subsets of my variables. This is going to be helpful because when we induce this factorization, the elbow will be affected by this induced factorization in the sense that this integral here might become significantly simpler. We discussed this in the abstract form in the last lecture. I mentioned that this approach is connected in physics to the idea of mean field theory, and so it's also sometimes um, uh, provided under, under this name, mean field theory. It's also sometimes called variational message passing. And it boils down to, I'm not going to do the derivation again, but it boils down to an iterative process where we induce our factorization, so we assume that the, the Q of Z that we want to use for our approximations separates into individual terms, and when we do that, we arrive at an algorithm through some derivations that are on this slide that I'm not going to redo because we did them in the last lecture, that says repeatedly in an optimization process, iterate through the individual subsets of variables that we have introduced by our, by our factorization that we have dis decided we want to have. And then, amazingly, we can do a closed form operation that, um, well, closed form in the sense that we get an explicit tractable term that tells us what the optimal choice for the approximate distribution Q J over some subset Z of J is without imposing its factorized, uh, its parametric form. We get told by the framework that the, this optimal choice is given by the logarithm of something that looks like a probability distribution and that thing is the expected value under the approximations Q for all the other variables that aren't the one we're currently looking at of the log of the joint plus arbitrary constants, which we need for normalization. This is possible because, again, of this relationship between the elbow and the KL divergence. Because we know that the, that the minimizing the elbow, sorry, maximizing the elbow, um, actually corresponds to minimizing a particular KL divergence relative to this, um, let's call it, uh, like an implicit joint distribution. And we know how to minimize KL divergences. We just set things equal on the left and the right hand side of the KL divergence. 
I said at the end of last lecture that this approach will become the final piece in our toolbox, in our machine learning algorithms toolbox for probabilistic inference. It's, an, it's called variational inference and it's an approach that is relevant whenever you want to compute an approximate possibility distribution over some quantity z under some generative model p for x and z for data x and latent quantity z. And you don't want to construct a point estimate. You don't want to do Markov chain Monte Carlo. You want to have an explicit probabilistic representation of a probability distribution that you can optimize because optimization tends to be easier than sampling. Well, because it, why? Because it converges after a finite number of steps and then you know that you have a approximation that is as, as good as it can be within this framework. And here is like a summary slide again that roughly describes what we're supposed to do. A, we introduce a factorization. So we say that we want to construct an approximation for um, Q for the distribution P of Z given X. And we only want, the only thing we want to put in externally, in addition to the fact that we have P to begin with, is that we impose that Q factorizes in a particular form. So we identify subsets of the variables and say well, such subsets should be independent under this approximation from other subsets. How close can we get with this factorizing distribution to the um, actual posterior in terms of KL divergence? And then once we've done that, what we're supposed to do is to construct an iterative algorithm which in each step computes the expectation under all the other approximations. So in every step, it goes through the subsets of variables j from 1 to whatever the number of subsets is. And then at each step computes the expected value under all the other subsets of the log joint. And then if you're lucky, we'll find that this expression which is a function of zj, it's a whole function, not just a number, that that function actually has the form of a particular log probability distribution for which we know the normalization constant, the constant, and then that's our approximation for this step of the iteration. If we keep doing that several times across the, um, the subsets of variables zj, then eventually this iteration will converge because it can be shown to be a convex operation in the space of functions Q. And then when it has converged, we'll call that the variational approximation. Now, I know that this particular presentation, even though it's actually the entire algorithm, is perhaps too abstract. It's very difficult to understand what this really means in practice because it leaves out many details. It leaves out how should we initialize the probability distributions and then what do we mean by looking at this function and seeing that it's somehow an approximation that is tractable. To understand how this works in practice, we have to look at some actual concrete examples and today we'll do that. We'll look first at the Gaussian mixture model again and see if we can find a probabilistic form of the Gaussian mixture model using the variational approach and then return to our large-scale example of our topic model and see if we can find a good variational approximation for these topic models and of course we can and we'll do so that it, it, you can already I can already tell you at the beginning of this process that the while the individual results will be different for these two different models actually the process will be very similar so we can now go first through the Gaussian mixture model and then when we do the topic model, maybe you have the time also mentally to find more of the structure and less of the concrete results. So let's get going. So here is our Gaussian mixture model again. To remind ourselves, we are observing, we're just observing those individual samples. These are locations in some input space. And the assumption that defines this model is that these data points are generated from several different Gaussian distributions. Each of these Gaussian distributions has a mean and a variance, or covariance, and we select one of those uh, Gaussian distributions with mean and covariances by um, assigning a membership to a particular cluster for each individual datum. To make this a Gaussian mixture model, we define mixture probabilities, pi. So those are numbers 
over this is a, uh, these pi's are vectors of length k that contain numbers that are non-zero and uh, uh, sorry that are non-negative and they sum to one so they are probabilities and to draw a datum the generative process is so to draw an x we first draw a cluster membership assignment z by drawing from the discrete distribution over cluster memberships that means that we get a vector z which has for this particular datum number n k entries only one of which is one all the other ones are zero and then now that we know which cluster we're in we draw a gaussian random variable from this gaussian distribution that is that defines this cluster it has a mean and a covariance we saw already back then that it's a good idea to introduce this auxiliary variable zn because it allows us to write the joint distribution like this with a double product rather than a sum over probabilities and no z. So the marginal distribution over x is a product over a sum, while the joint distribution over x and z is a double product, and that's convenient. This, uh, more abstractly, we can write it like this. So there is a probability for z given pi, and then a probability for x given z and mu and uh, sigma, and this conditional independent structure is reflected by this graph. To generate z, we draw from just the distribution parameterized by pi, and to draw x, we need z and mu and sigma, but not pi. To perform Bayesian inference in this model, or to, draw, to build a probabilistic version of this model, means that we want to replace those parameters, mu and sigma and pi, which are the parameters of, well, the EM version of, uh, of Gaussian mixture modeling, or they are very closely related to k-means, we want to replace those with probabilistic variables, with random variables to which we assign, or to, with variables to which we assign a probability distribution. This means that our likelihood for mu, sigma, and pi, um, which is a distribution over, those, over the data in these assignments, this turns into a joint distribution, a full generative model for the data x and the assignments z, but also the variables pi, mu, and sigma. I call them variables now rather than parameters because they have taken on this new role. And what is that joint distribution? Well, that joint distribution is the likelihood that we already have from up here times priors for those variables. It and now we get to choose, of course, what those priors should be. And as in the example of the topic model, a good idea here, probably a good design idea, is to choose priors for these variables that are not just exponential families, but also the exponential families that are the conjugate priors for the kind of observations we make in this likelihood. So Z is a discrete assignment, it's a draw um, a Bernoulli draw from a discrete probability distribution. So um, the conjugate prior for the unknown probability pi that Z is drawn from is the Dirichlet distribution. We've now encountered this many times, so let's just use that. Here is the PDF of the Dirichlet distribution again. Now the remaining two variables are the mean and the covariance of a Gaussian distribution. We would like to do joint inference and on the mean and the covariance of a Gaussian distribution. And the conjugate prior for this is actually the so-called Gauss inverse Vichar prior. This is this product for every single cluster of a Gaussian distribution over the unknown mean with a hyperparameter called the, um, the, well, it's the mean of this Gaussian distribution and a precision parameter beta times the covariance, the unknown, times the Vichar distribution over the inverse covariance with another two parameters, W being a positive definite matrix and U being a scalar parameter called the degrees of freedom. Now, this seems like might at first encounter, this might seem like a very complicated distribution. You've actually encountered the Vichar distribution on uh, an exercise sheet if you've done the, the theory exercises. Um, it's, I could at this point here do a big detour to show that this is in fact the conjugate prior for this combination of unknown mean and covariance. Maybe your tutors in one of the tutorials has already told you this, the story of William Seeley Gossett, the, um, 
Dublin, sorry, the London brewer for the, uh, for the Guinness company that, that uh, invented essentially this com combination of conjugate priors and um, the marginal distribution for X under this, under this prior is um, named after his pseudonym, the student T distribution. But we're not going to do that here. It's actually maybe simpler for you to pay attention to the uh, variational inference if I just tell you that this combination for every single cluster K separately, this combination just is the conjugate prior for these, uh, for, for um, observations that are drawn from a Gaussian distribution with unknown mean, unknown covariance. Well, actually, there should be a subscript K here so that we can learn a different covariance for every single cluster. Let me just fix that. Here we go. So, this is our generative model. And what we've just done here is a very rapid fire tour over stage two of the design process for a probabilistic model. We've essentially just written down a generative model by saying there are all these variables that I want to use to describe what's going on. Now let's just assign priors to them. Well, let's use standard exponential family conjugate priors to the variables that we get to see. So, so far, we haven't done any variational inference yet. We've just turned a maximum likelihood type problem into a problem of full Bayesian inference. Now, as we were doing that, we had to introduce those priors and as always, those priors, annoyingly, they have parameters. Because those exponential families themselves, of course, have natural parameters and they, those just show up. The Dirichlet distribution has a parameter called alpha, which contains pseudo counts. The Gaussian prior on the mean introduces two new parameters, let's call them m and beta, which are the prior mean and uh, or hyper prior mean and hyper prior uh, precision or scale and the Vichar distribution has two new parameters w and u. Here I have not indexed those hyper parameters with a subscript k for every single cluster. We could have done that. It would have made the graph more complicated. I'm just going to assume that we have a constant or a, well, a joint value for those hyper parameters for all the clusters. Maybe this is also not so bad, right? It, because when we want to have an algorithm in, in, that applies to a general data set, maybe we don't really have a reason to prefer one of the clusters over the other and, assign, and say a priori that we expect one of the clusters to be larger or more central or have a higher precision than the other. So we can use the same hyperparameters for every single cluster. Now, our goal will be not to estimate those parameters. Instead, we will want to estimate what the distribution should be over those new variables, mu, pi, and sigma, and maybe also z, but z is really a nuisance variable. We mostly care about pi. What would be the standard way of doing that? Well, it would just be Bayesian inference. We just multiply the prior by the likelihood and divide by the evidence to get a posterior over pi and mu and sigma. The evidence is this expression integrated against z and pi and mu and sigma. Now, we can already see from the graph that that's not going to be easy. Why? Well, because, so first of all, even if we had a way of integrating out z, well, we actually have, but we know what the marginal looks like, it's this product over sums, then this graph tells us that there is a collider structure. Pi and mu and sigma are all the parents of x. So when we condition on x, the parents will become conditionally dependent on each other. And because we can also see that the, the, the likelihood, if you integrate out z, is not an exponential family, we cannot expect to have a conjugate prior for these observations x or, a, well, a joint conjugate, right, for all the variables, mu and pi and sigma, simultaneously, given x. And we can't expect to get closed form Bayesian inference. So instead, we'll want to construct an approximation. And we've decided to use the variational approximation. Let's remind ourselves how that's supposed to work. So we, we would like to construct this posterior, which is intractable. So instead, we will assume that we, or we will hope to construct an approximate distribution, Q, over z and pi and mu and sigma, and we would like this approximation to be as close as possible to this posterior, which is a conditional distribution given x. 
to do that, we're going to try and minimize, so when we say close, for the, in, in the context of variational approximations, we mean that we want the KL divergence between Q and P to be as small as possible. And we'll do that not by minimizing the KL divergence, but by instead maximizing the elbow, which is the lower bound on the evidence where the distance between the lower bound and the evidence is the KL divergence. So when we maximize this lower bound, we'll minimize the KL divergence. And as discussed in the abstract before, we're not going to impose in a hard form that we want Q of Z and Pi and Mu and Sigma to have a particular form. We're not going to say, oh, I want Q of Pi to be a Dirichlet distribution or Q of um, mu and sigma to be to have in in terms of mu and sigma the, the form of a Gaussian distribution or a Vichard distribution. Instead the only thing we're going to impose is to say that we would like to have an approximation that factorizes in a certain way. A maximal thing to do would be, would be to say that every single variable in here that means every single datums zi and every clusters mu k and sigma k and all the pi's well, actually, not all the pi's are there together, or probability distribution, that wouldn't make sense. But pi should be independent of mu, and mu should be independent of sigma for every single cluster k. That would be a maximal factorization, and this is maybe the extreme form of what we might call mean field theory. But we're actually not going to do that. We'll try and get away with as little constraints as possible. Because every time we put further constraints on this q, we will make the... Um, the lower bound, the elbow, less and less tight, and the KL divergence that we can f that we can achieve with this more strictly constrained distribution will tend to, at least we have to be worried, that it'll become larger and larger, get further away from zero. So our approximation will have a lower quality. The only factorization I'm going to impose is this one. I will want to have a distribution over this whole set of variables such that Z under this approximation is independent from the other parameters. Why would I do that? Well, maybe it's just an educated guess. But given that we've seen that this, that this uh, indicator variable Z is really helpful to do k-means and maximum likelihood inference on uh, the parameters of the Gaussian mixture model, maybe this is the smart choice. And let's see how this whether it works, and indeed it turns out to be exactly the right thing to do. So now that we've made this assumption, now we can turn to our cooking recipe for how to compute variational bounds. This was a few slides ago. I'll go back and just to remind you, on here we had this expression that says, or there's a variant of it here, that says to construct the mean field approximation, go through the individual subsets of variables which you've assumed to be independent. Here, this, is, this notation, this z in, on this slide now corresponds to our entire set of variables, so z and pi and mu and sigma. And then for every single subset, for every term in the factorization, consider the function called log q star of zj which is supposed to be the, l the logarithm of the probability density function up to normalization of our approximate distribution. And that thing should be given by the expectation of the log of the joint under all the other variables that are not currently being considered. This is a function of zj, and therefore it, we can interpret it as a log probability distribution. So let's see what this looks like in our concrete um, probability, uh, probabilistic generative model. So we'll, we've decided to factorize into a distribution on Z and a distribution on pi, mu, and sigma. Let's first consider the distribution on Z. So this is our first subset of variables, Zj. And these are all the other ones, Zi unequal to J. We will want log Q star, the approximating distribution of this subset, called Z, to be equal to up to normalization constants the expected value under the other distribution, so Q of pi, mu, and sigma, of the log joint. Now, of course, at this point in the derivation, we don't know yet what this approximate distribution Q is. So we'll just have to assume that we will find it at some later point, and we just keep it as an abstract object around, and just think about the fact that we have to compute some expected values. Now, we can look at the actual shape of our 
joint distribution, the actual factorization properties of our joint distribution. So I can go back one, um, one slide. Here's the joint. And remember, that we, will have, we will have to compute expected values over, um, well, this distribution under mu and pi and sigma. Actually, this expression maybe isn't all that helpful yet. Let me go further up one, one, one step. So we know that the likelihood factorizes into a term that um, depends on pi and a term that depends only on mu and sigma. And the prior also contains a term that only depends on pi and a joint prior from mu and sigma. So that means we can, um, we naturally, just from the structure of the generative model, without making further assumptions, this expected value separates into a part that contains an expected value over pi, over the log of p and z given, given pi, and a expected value under the approximation on mu and sigma, whatever it may be, of the log of p of x given z and mu and sigma plus constants. And now we plug in the actual form of those distributions. So the p of z given pi, remember, is just a product over um, pi k to the z k. And a product over n. So it's a product over n product over, well, okay, let me show you the thing. Here it is, right? This expression is a product over n product over k, pi k to the z n k. So if you take the logarithm of that, we get the, um, ah, I just went two slides forward. Okay, sorry. So now we're back. <laughs> we get the, um, the z and k comes down and we get the expected value under pi of the log of pi k. Notice that z and k, of course, doesn't depend on pi, so it just moves outside of the expected value already. This other term here, those are the Gaussian distributions. So they are a Gaussian over x given mu k, sigma k, and um, at z k, so we can write that as, let me go back again, a product over n, a product over k, Gaussian of x n given mu k and sigma k to the z n k. If you take the logarithm of that part, again, those two products turn into a sum, the z n k comes down as before, and we're left with the log of a Gaussian. The log of a Gaussian is the a quadratic form, minus the quadratic form, with a one half in front, um, plus the log of the um, determinant of the inverse of the covariance matrix, and then plus constants. Of course, so that would be one half times the square root of pi, log of the square root of pi, uh, two pi, two um, times uh, d, right, the dimensionality. But those constants don't matter. We can push them into the constant here. They're just additive. So now we know that the log of, of our approximating distribution that we're looking for as a function of z looks like this. Now we notice that this expression here does not contain any z's. The z is the only term that shows up in the front here. So this means we, our, the, the functional shape of our distribution on z, which is the exponential of this expression, will be a double product over n and k of something, some complicated expression, to the power of z and k. And that is a discrete distribution. It's an independent discrete distribution for every single datum over all different clusters over um, some constant to the z and k. We'll just have to give a name to that constant. So we introduce a helper variable, an algorithmic variable, not, not a, a random variable, just something that will show up in our code that corresponds to the log of these probabilities. So we'll call those rho nk. That's the probability for, um, well, it's, it's not yet a probability distribution because there's a constant missing, right, the normalization constant, but that's going to be trivial to find because we know that this is a discrete distribution. So for every single datum n, we will have a separate probability distribution which just has to normalize. So the sum of the, the rho nk should be one. Well, we can just simply enforce that by just defining another variable r nk, which is rho nk divided by the rho y sum of the entries of, of, of uh, rho nj.
that tells us what exactly the probability distribution Q uh, over Z is. Actually, this should be an equal here. Let me just set that to equal. Zip. So now we have an equal sign because, of course, this is actually a probability distribution, right? So the R is sum to one. This really is just our approximating distribution. So this is only the first step of constructing our approximation. We have actually maybe not done the hard part yet. Um, we just have an approximating distribution over Z now. We still need one over mu and pi and sigma, the things we maybe care about more. But before we move on and care about that, there are already a few interesting things to point out about this approximation. So maybe the first one is we are reminded here and we're already using the notation R of the responsibilities that we know from um, k-means or from soft k-means from uh, EM on Gaussian mixture models. These are pretty much the same kind of variables where the quantities that show up in here are different. So we're going to get an algorithm that is not quite exactly the same as before. It's going to be a bit more elaborate. But the structure is very similar. Our update for the distribution on Z will give us a discrete distribution which contains probabilities. I mean, what else can it contain? It's just a discrete distribution. And those um, probabilities are computed in some form that now looks like sits here. And that form will be more complicated. And it'll determine in which sense the probabilistic formulation of Gaussian mixture models is a bit more useful, more powerful than the, um, the EM style update. Another thing to observe is that even though we didn't make any assumption about Q of Z, we just said we want to have an approximating distribution for Z. We didn't just get a discrete distribution. No, we got an independent discrete distribution. So every single datum has its own probability. There's a product over the N in front. This is, of course, convenient um, because um, now we get a nice, like, easily uh, factorizing, maybe even parallelizable structure. And we'll keep that in mind because we'll just encounter a moment later a similar but more interesting maybe structure in mu and pi and sigma. And the other, the final thing we need to notice at this point is that in the next step, when we complete our construction of the inner loop of the variational update, we will need to do the opposite thing. So we'll have to compute an expected value under Q of Z of this joint distribution. And that will typically require us to compute the expected value of Z. The expected value of Z, so which of the entries of Z is 1, is, because it's the expected value of a discrete distribution, is just given by R and K, by the actual probability for Z to be um, 1. So we can take this along, this property of this distribution, right? It's just a discrete distribution. It's one of the properties of discrete distributions. And we can just take that along into our next step. So now we consider the harder part, mu and pi and sigma. I'll use this simple notation up here, but we'll go back to that in a moment. Um, let me just um, uh, first look at what we actually have to compute, and then we'll, we'll use that up here when necessary. So. To, to do the other step, as I just said, we want to have an approximating variational approximation over pi, mu, and sigma. We haven't said that we wanted to factorize. We just want to have an approximation over pi, mu, and sigma. And that to get that, we'll have to compute the expected value under the other distribution, Q of Z, over the log joint. So we can go back and uh, look at what that joint is. Maybe by now we also know it a little bit by heart because we've spoken about it so much. So that joint is a prior, the arrow coming down from above into the graph over pi. That's a Dirichlet distribution with parameter alpha. We need a log of that. And then we need, um, there's a product in the, in the joint over the individual components, over the priors over mu and uh, sigma k, the log of that. Those are our Gauss inverse Vichar conjugate priors for inference and a Gaussian. In the Joint, there is a product, so now there's a sum in the log over the probability to be in the individual cluster uh, k given pi, that's a discrete distribution for um, z with probability pi. Finally, times or plus in the log, the probability for the individual datum given the cluster membership and the cluster parameters, and that's the Gaussian distribution. So we need the expected value of this object under our approximating distribution for Z. 
So where does that show up? Well, it doesn't show up in those two distributions and those two priors. It only shows up in the likelihood, which is here and there. So those two we can drag outside of our expected value and we're left with an expected value or for under Q of Z for the log of the uh, probability for Z given pi plus a expected value or um, under Q for the log of the Gaussian probabilities. And we notice that because of this conditional independent structure in a generative process, we now have two separate terms where we have to compute expected values. Here, I've already in this second uh, final part um, actually introduced our distribution for Z um, because we know that this, uh, this strong probability is like for, for the Gaussian, right? Is this in without the log, it's the product over the Gaussian to Z and K. So if we take the log of that, we just get another sum over Z and K and we need, that's the only point where Z and K shows up. So we can directly take our expected value inside of the entire sum, a double sum, because we know that Q of Z is a, um, con is a discrete distribution over the Z and K. Well, and what are those expected values of Z and K? Well, conveniently, we have already decided what those are. They showed up before, they are our R and K. So we know that we're just going to get our responsibilities R and K here. We can plug them in and we already know almost everything, everything we need to know at this stage. Well, there's also a, an expected value over Q of Z up here. Well, that's the expected value under Q of Z over the log of P of Z given pi. So let me go back up and see if we can find somewhere an expression for P of Z given, uh, given pi. Well, here it is, right? So log of P of Z given pi is well, before we look at different ex expected value, but it's just Z and K times the log of pi K. So the expected value of this is just gonna have an expected value of over Z and K here as well. And we're just going to get one more value of uh, R uh, and K in, uh, in here. So we will be able to compute this exact expression as a function of pi and mu and sigma and um, we, we will, uh, yeah, like this update will just tell us how, what, what to set those, uh, those numbers to. The, um, b before we do that, actually, before we really plug in what the actual values here are, let's first maybe notice that something very convenient has happened here when we look at the structure of this expression for our approximating distribution. To do that, I'll just um, copy the result, this final result here back up. So this is just a copy of what we've just seen. And now um, what you may notice is, is that is, if you consider where in this expression we see pi and where we see mu and k, then we can rearrange these terms and notice that there's a term in pi here and then a term in pi over here and pi doesn't show up in those two terms. Those two terms only depend on mu and sigma. And each of these terms that depend on mu and sigma have a sum over k in front of them. So what we're seeing here is that even though we only asked for, an for a, a factorization in our approximating distribution q between z and pi mu sigma, actually our optimization step, finding the best possible approximation, has told us that even this like weakly restricted opt optimal factorization or approximation has a further factorization. This resulting optimal distribution separates pi from mu and sigma and then within the group of mu and sigmas it again provides independent distributions for each mu k sigma k pair for each cluster of k. This is called an induced factorization. This is basically variational inference telling us that if you are separating Z from pi mu and sigma, then everything else becomes easy. They just separate into sub distributions. Now, what are those distributions? So let's first, since they now factorize, first consider this distribution on uh, um, pi. To do that, we just pick out the terms in this sum up here that where pi shows up. So that's this term and this term and everything else is just a constant from the point of view of pi. So our uh, so variational inference tells us that we should set log q star of pi to 
this expression plus a constant, that expression is, it's a log of a Dirichlet prior, so that is what the log of a Dirichlet prior is, right, up to constants. So remember, the Dirichlet is normalization constant times a product over pi k to the alpha k minus 1. But here for the prior, we've decided to use maybe a scalar parameter alpha. Every single cluster has the same prior probability, so all the alphas can go outside of the sum. Plus this term here, which is the log of p of z given pi. So remember the p of z given pi is a discrete distribution for like factorizes over all the data points. So it's a product over n, product over k, pi k to the z k. So if you take the log of that, we get a sum over n and k, z and k log pi k. We need to take the expected value of this under q of z, and we know from before that the expected value of z and k under this distribution, this discrete distribution, is just r and k, the responsibility of cluster k for datum n. And now we can look at this expression and wonder what kind of probability density function this is the logarithm of. This is a function of pi k, and we, can, we see that there is uh, log pi k showing up several times. So we can like, rearrange these terms, take the sums outside, and we get uh, sum over k, log pi k, times alpha minus 1 plus r and k uh, with a sum over n. And this is the logarithm of the distribution we're looking for up to normalization. So the distribution will be something that is like the product over k, pi k to the alpha minus 1 plus sum over n r and k. And that is, up to normalization, a Dirichlet distribution. So our optimal variational approximation to the distribution on pi that gets cl as close as possible to the full posterior is a Dirichlet distribution. A Dirichlet distribution with the, par with the parameter value that is set to the prior parameter plus the um, row-wise uh, sums over the responsibility. So it's the uh, pseudo count for the number of data, uh, data points that are assigned to cluster K. This is super convenient. This means that we've just inferred an optimal distribution, and it turns out that that optimal distribution doesn't have some complicated intractable form. Thanks to the factorization that we've imposed, it actually has the form of one of our standard data types, our exponential family um, distribution for discrete probability distributions, the Dirichlet. Now, what is the corresponding thing for the, for, the, for the parameters mu and sigma? Well, here I'll have to ask you to, to suspend this belief a little bit. If you really wanted me to do this derivation, it would take quite some time and it's very tedious. But if you look up on Wikipedia what the Gauss inverse Vichar prior is, and actually plug it in here and check what the expected, what kind of expected values you want to uh, comp compute. Well, the expected values here are easy, right? Because they are just r and k. Then you'll notice that if you take the log of this prior and the log of this likelihood, in fact, there is an, an, a closed form update that very similarly to the Dirichlet, to the form of the Dirichlet here, shows us that the, the log of the approximating distribution has a form that looks like the log of another Gauss inverse Vichar prior with updated parameters. And here the updates are these. Um, if you've ever done conjugate prior inference on Gaussians with unknown mean and covariance, then those updates look very um, unsurprising to you, maybe, like uh, very much expected. They are the typical updates to sufficient statistics under pseudo counts for observing a total of nk data points being softly assigned to cluster k at a, um, with, an, with a sample mean given by x bar and a sample covariance given by uh, this. So this part is, is maybe confusing at first sight, but what's really happening here is just we're just updating some parameters that define our data types Gauss inverse Vichar prior. Now, are we done yet? Well, we're almost done. If you think about the structure, we wanted to build a for loop that at every single iteration inside first estimates a Q of Z, then a Q of pi, mu, and sigma, and then repeats. So 
we've just written down here how we get our Q of pi, mu, and sigma. It turns out that it factorizes into a Dirichlet uh, distribution on pi and a Gauss, a product of Gauss inverse Vichar distributions on uh, mu and sigma k. And now what was, uh, let, let me let's just go back and check. We haven't forgotten about anything for Q of Z. Oh, there was a complication, right? So when we found our, our log Q star of Z, we only, we only knew that it would be a discrete distribution, but we didn't know yet what the parameters of that discrete distribution are because at that point, we didn't know yet what our approximating distributions for pi and mu and sigma would be. So to close the loop, we now have to do that. And this is like the interesting, the wonderful thing about these variational bounds that we could derive them while only abstractly assuming that we have this approximating distribution and using the form of this, like the functional form to discover that it's a discrete distribution. Now that we know what our approximating distributions for pi and mu and sigma are, we can go back and ask what are those quantities actually. And so here, what you usually have to do when you do this in practice is that you look up some standard properties of the approximating distribution. Again, I'll mostly do this for the Dirichlet because it's easier. And then for the um, Gaussian here, this is really the log of a Gaussian, it's um, just something we can look up. So if you, we will now know that our approximating distribution for, <coughs> excuse me, now we know that our approximating distribution for pi is a um, Dirichlet distribution. So what we need is the expected value under a Dirichlet of the log of the probability distribution that the Dirichlet is a distribution over. Well, what is that? Well, okay, if, if, if in doubt, let's go to Wikipedia. Here it is and check out what we might find here about the log distribu the, lo the expected value of the log of pi. Well, there's in, in the little bar here on the side, there's something about the entropy of the Dirichlet. Oh, that's good because the entropy is something like the expected value of the log but of the log PDF, not of the parameters. But let's go to the corresponding section on the entropy. And lo and behold, there is an expression here that we can just um, read off. So the expected value of the log of the individual entries of the Dirichlet is given by the difference between, oh, two things. And those things are called the digamma gamma function. Um, so I actually have those in here on my corresponding slide as well. Here we go. So here's, here are some standard properties of the Dirichlet that you can look up. I basically copied them from, I literally copied them from Wikipedia. I'm just using the nice symbols that are not so straightforward to Wikipedia. The expected value under a Dirichlet distribution of the log of its parameter is given by this thing called the digamma function. The digamma function is the derivative of the log of the gamma function. You don't need to know how to implement that because conveniently our nice toolboxes provide these for us. So someone else has already done the hard work of implementing this function. It might seem like magic that we can do that, but maybe you've, like, you, you're, you're also using all the time little library operations that, ev that evaluate exponential functions or error functions or various other non-trivial intractable functions that we, someone has just found a really good approximation for on a computer that uses floating point operations. So there's also something in the SciPy special library that computes the digamma function for us. And the expected value of the log of pi d, so here xd for the standard Dirichlet, is the digamma function, this thing of the individual parameter value of this vector alpha d, and the, minus the digamma function of the sum over all the entries in this distribution. So we know what that thing is, what that expected value of, let me go back, of log pi of k is. It's just something that a computer knows how to evaluate. And similarly, we'll need to evaluate this expression under a, so the, expect, so the expected value of a log of a Gaussian under a Gauss inverse Vichar prior distribution and similarly here, we can go to Wikipedia or somewhere else and look up the corresponding um, quantities. So if you go on Wikipedia and go to uh, the Vichar distribution, you'll be able to find somewhere below that it has some complicated expected value, which again uses some digamma function, a version of the digamma function, which is the multivariate digamma function. Again, something available in a toolbox. So, we get to use 
standard tools that come, are provided to us by uh, powerful libraries, A, because someone has written those libraries for us, and B, because we made the smart choice of using exponential family priors in our model. Here again and again, as in Gaussian modeling, in this generalization of probabilistic modeling, we get a handsome payoff for being willing to use standard probability distributions, exponential family distributions. So if your question was ever, why should I use exponential family distributions? Here is the answer, because it makes your life so much easier. Even though, of course, they don't perfectly capture exactly what you want to say about the, dis about the distribution. So our update for the, um, uh, the responsibilities will involve these quantities that we can, we can just evaluate on a computer and they will just have some form that we can actually plug in and then update. This closes our loop and it allows us to go, um, to, go like, to, to, to build an algorithm which iteratively updates in, in succession our discrete distribution on, um, on Z and our Dirichlet distribution on pi and our Gauss inverse gamma distribution on the parameters of those Gaussian distributions. If you implement this algorithm, and here I have to go a little bit quick because I also want to talk a little bit about the topic model, then you'll get a method that estimates probability distributions, marginal probability distributions, for all the parameters of our Gaussian mixture model. The mixture components, uh, mixture component weights, pi k, and the individual parameters of the Gaussian distributions, mu and sigma. And we can use those to also directly infer a posterior over z. So which data point belongs to which uh, cluster. And because it's a um, probability distribution, it can fix some of the issues that the, uh, the, the non-probabilistic, non the point estimation version, the EM algorithm has. One of them being that it can basically effectively figure out how many cluster components there actually are because a Dirichlet distribution can be sparse. It just can find solutions that put zero probability on some of those, uh, of, of those components if we start with prior parameters alpha that have a few, uh, that have values that are less than, um, less than one. To give you just a quick idea of what this, what this works like, uh, here's the update equation, okay? So you can find that in the slides. Um, if you, the quick idea of how this works like is here's a, a, a few snapshots of this algorithm running on the uh, old faithful data set that we encountered the last two lectures. Uh, this is a plot that, uh, on code that was written by Anne Katrin Schalkamp. And here you see the algorithm initialized with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven components. This is already like two or three steps in. It started off with completely random assignments. And now the algorithm has honed in, found some clusters. And now it notices that it's actually, um, like it's actually better in terms of lowering the variational bound, sorry, raising the elbow, lowering the KL divergence, to assign marginal probability zero to some of those clusters and instead grow some of the other clusters. And as that happens, some of those clusters drop out. They just vanish from the approximation. And in the end, the algorithm actually finds a clustering that only contains two clusters, which is intuitive because if we look at the data set, we, only, we also really see two clusters. And this uh, approximating distribution finds an, in expectation two Gaussian clusters that have a non-trivial covariance structure. They are aligned to the data set and therefore provide, well, okay, arguably a better description of what's going on here than the EM version. And here I haven't even, so this is the advantage of a prior, right? And here I haven't even shown you the full probabilistic output, which of course assigns a probability distribution to all of these parameters. So if you had very few data points, the algorithm would in fact be very uncertain about all of those parameters as well. Impressive, no? So now you might say, well, thank God I don't have to implement this because it seems really complicated. 
but hang on, there is something you will have to implement soon in your exercises, and that's the topic model. Can we construct a variational bound for the topic model as well? Maybe let's not spend too much time on this Gaussian mixture model and instead actually have a look at our topic model so that I can help you a little bit with that homework. The advantage of doing this, by the way, will be that you get to see the very same structured derivation twice and the only thing that changes is the model structure underneath. So maybe this helps for you to quickly get the gist of what we're trying to do without having to focus too much on implementation details just by getting two different examples. So here is our topic model again. Um, we've now seen this slide several times. Just to remind you again, we're talking about a corpus of documents that is considered to consist just of counts of words, so a bag of words, where each word is assumed to be generated by assigning a discrete distribution over topics to each document, assigning a discrete distribution over words from a vocabulary to each topic, and then for each word in each document, drawing a topic from the document topic distribution and drawing a word from that topic um, identified by that assignment. We uh, saw, we've now looked several times and at length at the corresponding generative model. Well, this graph that I just showed you is maybe nice and clean. This is what it looks like in math. This is our joint distribution for the unknown topic word or word topic assignments, the document topic distributions, the topic word distributions, and the actual words that we get to see. Only this thing is data, all the other stuff is latent variables. The last, the only algorithm we have so far, or the only class of algorithms we have so far, are sampling algorithms, the Gibbs sampling algorithms, where we iterate between sampling C and pi and theta. In fact, I pointed out two lectures ago that there is a simplification, a speed up version, where we can actually marginalize out c, uh, theta and pi, the two quantities we actually care about, in order to sample lots of c's jointly in a collapsed Gibbs, fashion, uh, Gibbs sampling fashion, and then only afterwards consider implied posterior distributions for theta and pi. And the reason for that is that there is a structure in this model that is not unlike the Gaussian mixture model, which is that when we condition on c, the distribution on theta and pi is convenient, and if you condition on theta and pi, the distribution on C is convenient. So maybe this hints at a situation where we can once again hope that our variational approach could also help by us imposing from externally that we want to separate the way we construct approximations on C from the way we construct approximations on theta and pi, because then that factorization that we already saw, this conditional factorization we already saw for the Gibbs sampler might help us here again. So our assumption is going to be that we want an approximation for those unknown variables pi and theta and uh, C that factorizes between C and pi and theta. And as before in the Gaussian mixture model, we will not make any further assumptions about factorization, but spoiler alert, we'll discover that the optimal approximation factorizes further, another case of induced factorization. And as before, we'll try and construct this approximation by variational inference, which means we're going to try and minimize the KL divergence between the factorizing approximation Q and the true posterior over those unknown variables by not explicitly minimizing KL divergence, but maximizing the evidence lower bound, the elbow, minimizing variational free energy. And this amounts to, as we've now seen several times, not a numerical process of optimizing an elbow, which it can also be, but here it won't be. Instead, we'll find a closed form update. We'll find that by once again following this um, central fundamental equation of these uh, mean field approximations, which is to construct iteratively our two approximations, the approximation on C and the approximation on pi and theta, by computing the expected value of the log joint distribution under the other approximation. So we'll construct the approximation for C by computing an expected value of the log joint under the approximation for pi and theta, and then vice versa. So here is the joint, this is the whole thing. And we want to have an expected value of this expression for, uh, as a function of C, because we are trying to look for an approximation, for a proximal distribution on C, 
if we take expected values of pi and theta under an approximation that we don't yet know. Now to do that, we look at this expression, and we realize, if you take the log of this, that there's going to be a bunch of terms in here and in here that do not contain c at all. So they are only contributing constants, if you take the log, um, so we can subsume them in the constant. And then what we're left with are only the inner bits. The inner bits are in the joint, a product over D and I and K. So over the documents, the words and the topics over pi DK times theta KWDI to the power of CDIK. If you take the logarithm of that, there's going to be a lot of sums over D and I and K over the logarithm of this product. The logarithm of pi dk theta kwdi times cdik. Oh, there's a cdik missing here. Let me just fix that. Yep, here we go. So now it's correct. And this also tells us exactly what we need to do if we take the uh, expected value under whatever the, whatever the approximation for um, pi and theta is, we can drag it inside into the sum for the individual terms. The individual terms of the log, pi dk, theta dw di. And um, notice that really, this is really at the core why we introduce these factorizations. If we wouldn't have this factorizing assumption, then at this point we wouldn't be able to drag anything inside here and we'd be stuck. So by imposing factorization, we're able to compute those uh, expected values. Well, we don't actually know yet what the expected values will be, but that's just entirely analogous to the situation in the Gaussian mixture model. We just accept that there will be some numbers here. And as a function of C, we notice that this log probability distribution is a product over D, I, and K over the C, D, I, K times some number plus a constant. So the, uh, if you take the exponential of that, we know that the distribution for C, D, I, K will be a factorizing over DNI, set of discrete distributions with some probability distribution, uh, with some probabilities uh, as, a, as a parameter vector, which are normalized versions of this, these, these numbers here, whatever they might be, raised to the power of CDIK. So what we can do is we can introduce a, um, a helpful notation. We'll call those things pseudo counts. So they are called log gamma DIK. And we can use them to define actual probabilities, um, which are analogous to the responsibilities we have in the, uh, the, the Gaussian mixture model, which we'll call gamma tilde d i k, which are just normalized versions of those gamma d i k, where normalization happens over the topics, because every single of these assignments has to be a probability distribution over the topics for it, word i in document d. So that's the first part. This is like computing the approximating distribution for the cluster memberships in the Gaussian mixture model. And now we can move forward and ask, what is the corresponding step for our approximating distribution for theta and pi, given that we now know that we're going to have a discrete distribution over C? So for that, the top part here is the same as before. I've just changed something down here. The uh, the optimal distribution, uh, approximating distribution over theta and pi will be an expected value of the log of this big thing up here under our now found approximating discrete distribution over the ent entity CDI. Okay. What if we take, if we look at this expression and take the logarithm of it, then we can notice again that, um, as we've done in previous lectures, that there is a big part here on the left that only depends on pi. And the big part here on the right, that only depends on theta. And they don't have mutually an effect on each other. They're just a product of each other. So if we take the logarithm of that, we'll get a big sum over here with just pi's and, of course, c's in there, and a big sum over there with just theta's in there. Now we plug in the actual form for a Dirichlet prior. So um, well, by the way, of course, we notice that we have products over d on uh, both sides that we can take out and products over uh, a product over over um, um, V's and um, I's on either or, uh, no sorry a product over topics on either sides case so we can drag them out and we'll 
we'll find that we first uh, see that the Dirichlet priors for each individual document will show up. Those are, remember, the business end of the Dirichlet is a product over the pi dk to the power of alpha dk minus 1. That's the bit over here. And then there's a normalization constant, which doesn't matter. We'll push it into the constant. And then in here, we have another sum over d and over k and over i over the log pi dk. And in front of that, of that log is a c d i k. Now, this sum over i and, um, yeah, just the sum over i, we can simplify, we can kind of collapse into this convenient notation with pseudo counts n that we've already encountered previously. So we'll just use those pseudo counts again. They were really helpful for us in the Gibbs uh, sampler when we implemented it. So they'll be helpful for us again now if we use, um, if we use, if we do variational inference. It's also convenient for you because if you've already found a good convenient data structure to, to deal with those, you can reuse it. Similarly, on the right hand side, there's basically an entirely analogous thing that we can directly um, reuse. And now there's a different sum that we're taking a sum over. Here we need the, the pseudo counts of how often we've seen any word in document D in topic K. And here we'll need a count over how often we've seen in any document the word we being assigned to topic K. We need to take the expected value of this expression under those discrete distributions. So we'll need expected values for the pseudo counts um, or the, sorry, for the counts n d k v, if you like. And those are going to be really convenient to compute because these are expected values over some of samples from discrete distributions. And as you may convince yourself, those are because the expected values of the individual values of C are given by the gamma, gamma tilde from above. So let me go back up again, right? So the expected value of C d i k is just gamma tilde d i k. And because all the C's are independent of each other, over d, over i, and well, once we've normalized the gamma tildes also over k, we can just compute this, like the sums over them, which are given by the n's, by summing over the gamma tildes because you know, the expected value of a sum is the sum of the expected values if the random variables are independent of each other as they are under our approximation. So that means we can now stare at these expressions knowing what will come out of here. So here we just get um, sums over pseudo counts and here as well over gamma tildes and um, try to figure out what kind of distribution this may be. This is the like final step in these in these uh, these inner parts of these of these variational approximations, as before for the Gaussian mixture model. So we see that as a function of pi, this approximating distribution over q uh, over pi and theta is so. First of all, there's a separate term for pi, and then a separate term for theta. There's no pi in this sum, and there's no theta in this sum. So actually, we're getting two separate distributions: one over pi and one over theta. How convenient, there's gonna be some induced factorization again. And secondly, what are those distributions? Well, they are independent over documents. And then over all the topics, because these things have to sum to one, there is a, a product over some parameter, sorry, over pi dk raised to some parameter. And that distribution up to normalization is again a Dirichlet distribution because Dirichlets are constant times product over k pi dk raised to some power. And that power is just the thing up to the minus one that um, we've already seen here, right? So that, that we, just, we just plug in those parameter values. So our approximating variational distribution for pi will be a Dirichlet distribution. And the approximating dist distribution for theta, which is independent of it because of induced factorization, will also be a Dirichlet distribution because it's of the same functional form. It just has a somewhat more annoying um, parameter vector value because we have to sum over the gamma d i k in a, in a way that uses which word actually has which identity. So we need to have an, an indicator variable that tells us how to collapse our pseudo counts or our, our approximate probability distributions. <clears throat>
And you can maybe imagine that implementing this requires a little bit of NumPy foo, but um, in principle, once you have dealt with this array, you have a Dirichlet distribution again. So very much analogously to the Gaussian mixture model before, we now have an explicit approximation for theta and pi, given that we have a discrete approximation on the C variables, so the word topic assignments. And there are Dirichlet distributions, actually very similar also to the, um, to the cluster membership probabilities assignments in the, in the Gaussian mixture model. And the only thing that's missing to close the loop, to be able to continue this process, is the bit that we just assumed to have, the kind of induction assumption we made on the previous slide, where we said, well, we somehow will have to be able to compute the log, the expected value of the log of those two probability distributions, so actually the sum of them two, right? Because the log of pi times theta is the log of pi plus the log of theta. So we have to be able to compute those um, expected values of logs under those approximating distributions. And as before, as in the Gaussian mixture model, we get to do that because we know what the expected value of the log of pi and theta is under a Dirichlet distribution. We can look it up and find again that the expected value of the log is this um, difference between two digamma functions. And that tells us how to write our variational inference algorithm. It's going to be a for loop around the whole thing that will, and I'll show you pseudocode in a, in a moment, which at each iteration of the loop, given that it has some assignments gamma tilde dik to the individual topics, um, word, uh, word topic assignments, huh? that's the difficult word, given that it has those, it can compute the pseudo counts, those n, uh, n variables, n dik, collapse them over i, and get updates for our uh, Dirichlet distributions on pi and with a little bit of slightly more work also on theta. And then, given that we have those, we can compute expected values, and that's actually the business end, of the log um, values of pi and theta using um, the uh, using uh, digamma functions, which are available in software libraries for us to compute the, um, the, the new values for the gamma dik, which we can then normalize and we're done. I've already plugged in the expressions for the digamma functions here. You may notice that there is a minus digamma over some other sum missing if, and it's this thing, it's the sum over this bit, if you're wondering why, then maybe like, look at it afterwards for yourself when you do the implementation, when you do the corresponding homework, and convince yourself that we don't need that quantity because it actually drops into the normalization. So with that, we can build our algorithm. And now I want to do a quick detour, a very minor additional thing before we're done, which is that may maybe it's a bit confusing to you that, and that that's totally fine, if we that, that what we're doing here is we are trying to maximize this object, this elbow, this evidence lower bound, to minimize KL divergence between the approximation and the posterior. But we have never actually computed so far this function itself. So this bit which we are maximizing, we haven't even computed. We are just building updates to these approximating distributions Q, and it's entirely implicit that we are actually raising this bound. And that's correct this way. But if we want to, and I very much recommend that you do this as a unit testing, as a bug fixing exercise, we can in fact compute this evidence lower bound. Here is the corresponding computation. So to compute our evidence lower bound, we need to, and this is just from the definition of what it is, we have to compute, actually let me go back to, again to show this again, right? So the evidence lower bound is the expected value under the approximation distribution of the ratio between the joint and the approximating distribution of the log of the ratio between the joint, right? So here is another way of writing that. That's the expected value under the approximation of the log of the joint plus the entropy, 
because my expected value of minus log of Q under Q is just the entropy of Q. So for that, we can, we can plug in what we know. We know that, um, uh, so we need, we need to compute an expected value under, under, um, under Q of this joint distribution. Here is our log of the joint distribution. Here's our log joint again. And um, add the entropy. And now for the entropy, things are particularly convenient because we know that there's a factorization between those distributions. And there's also an induced factorization between theta and pi. So we'll get entropies, completely factorizing entropies of Dirichlet distributions over theta for every topic k, Dirichlet distributions over the over pi for every document d, and Dirichlet distributions for the topic word assignments or word topic assignments, I don't know, for every single word and every single document separately. And those are just entropies over discrete distributions, so they're just sums of logs weighted by the corresponding gammas. And those entries up here, they require us to compute expected values under those Dirichlet and discrete approximations for the log of this joint. Now remember that the log of this joint is just a big sum we can, where we can rearrange terms. And then the only bit where theta and pi shows up is in here. And that's also the only bit where C shows up. And we, the C will come, well, is hidden in those ends, which will come down in the sum if you take the log. So to compute those values, maybe you can imagine without the exp explicitly doing it, that you can look up in those tables again using what we know about expected values of the n's and expected values of the log pi and log theta, that the fact that they are digamma functions, we can actually compute this object in closed form. And it'll give us a number. Now we don't need to know this number to run variational inference because the update loop itself already improves the bound. But we can use these numbers and watch them change first to convince ourselves that we are actually raising this lower bound and maybe secondly even to check convergence. We don't necessarily have to do this, uh, you have to check convergence this way, we could also just check whether the parameters alpha and beta and gamma tilde of our approximating distributions actually change and if they don't change anymore then we could also call convergence. But it's maybe reassuring to know that we are actually raising an, an, a lower bound. With that, here is our pseudocode, finally, for variational inference in our topic model, in our latent Dirichlet allocation model. And it has a structure that you might recognize if you've built the Gibbs sampler, because it has a very similar kind of process, just that the individual operations are a little bit different. They don't involve sampling random numbers, but assigning pseudocounts that get iteratively updated. We begin by assigning random topic identities, to topic probability distributions for every single word in every single document and setting the bound to minus infinity. And then for every document and every topic, update the document topic distribution according to this update rule, which we just derived, then updating the topic word distributions by summing over those sufficient statistics as before. And then finally, and this is maybe the more complicated part, the computationally more demanding part, for every document, every word, every topic, recomputing uh, this word's topic assignment probabilities by computing an expected value over a bunch of digamma functions, which come from a library, and normalizing across the topics. And if we want to, at the end of this iteration of the loop, we can compute the bound until this bound doesn't change anymore, until it has saturated, and then the, um, that bound is a lower bound on the marginal likelihood for this model, so for the marginal evidence, for the probability for W under uh, this model. We can do various things with this bound, by the way, but we'll get to that in a, the next lecture. For today, I think we should wrap it up here, and then next lecture I'll get to tell you a little bit more funny special stuff. What we finished today was the introduction of the final tool in our toolkit. Variational inference is a powerful mathematical framework to construct approximate, fully probabili probabilistic approximations, so approximations that are probability distributions, 
And in many cases, we don't have to impose those uh, a strict parametric form on those approximations, but instead we can find optimal approximations by imposing only a very mild re requirement, which is that the approximation distribution should be factorizing in a certain way. And then we can find such approximations by iteratively increasing a lower bound on the evidence, thereby minimizing the KL divergence to the posterior from the approximation. And that actual update step involves computing expected values of the log joint under the approximating distribution. An advantage of this approach over Monte Carlo is that it's an optimization process, so it's a deterministic process that ends at some point, and then it gives us a full probability distribution. This can be much more efficient than Markov chain Monte Carlo because we don't have to wait for a Markov chain to mix and we don't have to check that it mixes. It's very easy to watch and check and uh, notice uh, convergence. However, as you've clearly seen, doing those derivations requires some work. It requires knowing your model very well and it requires more than anything else, very careful model design so that your derivations later on actually work out in your favor. So using carefully designed graphical models with very careful associated jo um, uh, choices of exponential family distributions really helps with those derivations. Ne even then, though, they tend to be tedious to do, as you've now clearly seen. That's why there's an old joke in the community that even though Markov chain Monte Carlo methods might, be, might take longer to converge and to mix, Maybe you can try and derive your variational bound in the time it takes for the Markov chain Monte Carlo method to mix. There is a hidden truth behind that joke, which is that MCMC methods are a good initial way of testing a model because they tend to be relatively easy to implement. And variational methods tend to be the tool that you might want to use in production because they're more stable, they can be made more computationally more efficient and they're occasionally also more easy to interpret and to deal with. With that, we have our toolbox complete for this term. Of course, there are more algorithms that one, one might use um, that uh, I didn't have time to cover in this uh, comp comprehensive but nevertheless infinite um, lecture course. Nevertheless, I think that we have a very powerful tool set together now which provides an uh, ample opportunity to build very explicit, very expressive, very powerful probabilistic models that quantify uncertainty in structured representations of knowledge. In the next two lectures, we'll finally think about a few more ways of, um, uh, of improving and uh, deviating from those structures, how to use them in practice in our topic model, but that's for the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention and see you next time.